Professor Orchin Zuberskirit, convener of the third postgraduate research and supervision program funded by the Federal Department of Employment, Education and Training, Australia. Professor Zuberskirit introduces this video program. The videos are based on recordings of a staff development program for supervisors of postgraduate students in the newly amalgamated university campuses. This program was held at the Hyatt Regency on the Gold Coast of Queensland in Australia in September 1995. New university campuses established since 1987 have experienced many exciting challenges. These can be observed in at least four areas. One, staff facing the transition from a purely teaching role to the responsibilities as researchers and teachers of postgraduate research students. Two, staff having to teach increasing numbers of postgraduate students with reduced resources. This has often led to increased staff workload and stress. Three, universities facing increasing accountability to research students, society, employers and taxpayers. All these stakeholders have a legitimate right to expect this accountability in terms of quality outcomes and cost effectiveness. Four, staff being expected to upgrade their academic qualifications through PhD studies, while at the same time having to supervise postgraduate research students. How then can we assist the new university campuses in further improving the quality of postgraduate education and fostering an institutional research culture? This video series and accompanying written materials aim First, to improve the quality of university teaching and learning at the postgraduate level in the new university campuses. Two, to develop postgraduate supervision skills in a way which will achieve a multiplier effect in each institution. Three, to provide support materials of which these videos are a part and which can be used by the participants and others in their own institutions. Four, to address existing and new issues in postgraduate supervision and generate solutions to these problems from the participants themselves in conjunction with national and international leaders in this field. I hope you will appreciate the following video. So what I want to talk with you in this next hour and a half is more from the student's point of view. What is it that makes their environment conducive to good research? I'm taking up the idea that was said earlier that students are motivated. I mean, they're not on the whole to undertaking research degrees just to please somebody. They're mostly trying to please themselves, and they are mostly, in fact, fired and enthused by the possibility of research. So I'm taking, in a sense, our students for granted. And what I want to do now is to think, how can we make it possible to develop those students to become fully competent researchers for the rest of their lives? Because, of course, once you've got the bug, you never lose it. Just very quickly, this is double, double quick. Just two words, could you list two things that were a problem in your own progress when you were doing research, and if you're in the progress, process of doing research, two problems that are now a problem for you. And then in the second thing, could you list two problems that you believe are problems with your students? So we will keep reflecting on the dangers that can happen. In the meantime, I'll push you, which is of course undesirable, but actually quite desirable. Never let people get bored. Don't let them have too many ideas because they won't be able to sort them out, particularly your academic colleagues. Academic colleagues are specifically trained to raise objections, <laughs> and therefore they are extremely difficult to run workshops with. And you have to run it in such a way that only one person, usually from table eight down there, gets to say something. <laughs> okay. Okay, basically then my own background is I come from the ANU, which is not a new university. A university with, I think, a thousand PhDs at the moment. Uh, 
20% plus of our students are graduate students in the university. Now, it isn't that we are setting up a new system. We are attempting to change the ruts into which it is so easy to fall. Now, what I want to do in this session is raise some issues. I can't offer you solutions, and that's a very good strategy. Don't offer people solutions. Raise the issues so people can work out their own solutions, both individually and within the environment in which you're working. There are no global solutions to the kinds of problems that we are dealing with. If there were, we'd write a book and we wouldn't need a conference. Secondly, by focusing on student needs, I am implicitly in focusing, therefore, also on supervisor needs. We see a great many students in my center coming in saying, my supervisor this, I can't meet my supervisor, I only meet him in the airport, she's never around, she's been fired, she's been promoted, her tenure's over, all sorts of things. And one of the things that we do in our center is help students manage their supervisors, quite explicitly. And as you will see later in some of the handouts I've given you, there are in fact suggestions in the pages five and six there to students about how they might manage their supervisors. We work in that direction. It is a two-way management negotiation problem. I will draw on ANU because in fact over the last three years we've made a major shift. We now have a graduate school. And this has raised many of the issues that are absolutely central to this workshop. And the effort to start a graduate school and to make it work has been, I should think, worse than starting something new in a new university. Right, now what I want to talk about, get this going, is that what is the development that we are looking for in our students? Not in the research, but in the students as researchers. The students come in <coughs> ignorant. I don't mean ignorant intellectually, they come in not knowing their way around the system. They have never been research students before, and even if they've been honors students, this is a substantive and qualitative shift. And we want them to go out, we want them to be informed about how the environment works. Secondly, they come in and very often will feel isolated, particularly if they've come from another university or from another country. And what we want them to do, as has already been discussed, is to become integrated, first of all, into the research culture of our own institution, such as it is, and later into the whole community of proper scholars, scholars that are going to go on thinking intelligently for the rest of their lives. That's what we're on about, I think. And the third thing, when they come in, they're immensely insecure. What is their relationship to their supervisor? What is, how do they get anything out of the lab technicians? And we want them ultimately, of course, to become independent. Not dependent on us, not just grateful to us, but independent as scholars. And then always my subtext, because that's my own particular interest, is if we're thinking about that for any students, what do we have to think about for our international students? What is the institutional environment within which we are working to move these students towards these desirable qualities, these desirable skills? Physical resources, regulations, who can be a student, how long can they have, what are their rights, etc., etc. The research community, the academic and research needs, particularly of different disciplines, and the support structure. What kind of support is available, not just for students, not just for human beings, but for research students who are a very specialized and particular and fraught group of human beings? Physical resources, the kinds of things that students are concerned about. First is workplace. Access to computers, and if they don't know how to use them, training. Email and internet. And students will often teach our academic staff how to make productive use of that. Library resources, lab equipment, photocopying and fax. Is it restricted? Is it four pages a year? Does somebody have the key? And accommodation and transport. Those are some of the physical resources. And they all need to be taken into account before we start filling up our institutions with fee-paying, possibly, certainly researching graduate students. What about the regulations? Graduate students are beset by bureaucracy particularly international graduate students. What are the degree regulations? Do they know them? How can they find them out? Do you know them? That's often a more crucial question. What are the regulations about the thesis? 
Is there a length? Is there this, that, and the other? They must know what they're aiming at before they start. Right, what kind of research community in this environment are we trying to build? How can we do it? Departmental school faculty seminars. Are they run for students? Do students take part in it? Are they automatically told about them? Social event events in the, in the particular areas. Even having access to leave your sandwiches in the fridge that belongs to the staff uh, room could be very important. It's particularly important for international students because they will tend to be very shy, they will tend to retreat unless there are places where actually people are forced to meet, forced to fight over the tea urn. One tea urn is better than two. Okay, a research student's organization, that's absolutely crucial, I think. Um, it becomes a lobby group, it becomes uh, a support for the dean of the graduate school when he wants something and he supports them. In my own center, when we wanted a specialist advisor for graduate students, we went to the research students' organization and said, please make a fuss. And they made a fuss, and immediately we got the person we needed. Student power should never be underestimated when you're trying to improve conditions. Really very important. Other parts of your research community, labs, research teams, and in our case, graduate programs. But the most crucial part of the research community for the student is the supervisor or the supervisory panel. You cannot be skilled counselors, you cannot be financial advisors, you cannot be marriage guidance counselors. You can't be all those things, nor should you be. But it's absolutely essential that you know who are these, who has this expertise, and you know them personally, so that you can ring up. We've got a worried student in your office, you can ring up and say, hello, Joe, can I send someone over to you? The role of intermediary, is vital and doubly vital for international students, where it will be expected in many cases that as supervisor, you will in fact serve this role as intermediary. But if we look at the kinds of support that we would hope to have or move towards having in order to provide the environment in which our students can flourish, computer services are now almost at the top. I hate saying this. Um, it's just, it's been a complete shift in my view of the research environment over the last 10 years. Access to computer services, good computer services. I put the second one there because that's what I am. Learning Skills Center is really quite useful. In other words, someone who can help students when they run into intellectual problems. You need a welfare officer, you need an international student's office, a health center, obviously, but research students get sicker than most. Um, counseling service, career service, there will be life after the thesis and editing and publication assistance. How are they going to get their things done? Who can help them format? So they'll need booklets, they'll need orientation programs, and they'll need individual references, that is, telling people where to go by you as the supervisor. You must know your environment if you're going to help the students be informed about it. Secondly, how are we going to integrate these students? Well, again, Obviously, seminars, graduate programs, socials are all ways of integrating. Who's going to do all this? Well, if you have a graduate students association, they'll do some. Maybe if you have a graduate school or a graduate organization within your department or faculty, and do invite them to departmental activities, unless those activities are so unpleasant that you wouldn't want them to come, which is, of course, always possible. But basically, information isn't just, of course, booklets. A lot of it should be on IT, on email, on the net. And in the handout that I've given you, I've given you the ANU Graduate School's address on the net because we are gradually putting quite a lot of our information on that, and it's open to everybody. So on that net, there is advice on, to students, advice to supervisors, lots of different issues. But ultimately, of course, what we are moving these students towards, as I said, and I'm absolutely convinced of this, is independence. And don't forget, independence happens very gradually. The awful thing that we do very often when we're working with students is we think that we've said something wise and they should take it in immediately, like that. Now, actually, most students take three years minimum to get a degree. 
And it's over the three years they will develop this independence. They're not going to be independent the moment they walk through the door in most cases. And many of them are not going to be independent for quite a way down the track. So things take time. Allow time for development. And if you are trying to change or innovate within your institution, allow a lot of time and allow at least two failures before you get what you want. That's my experience. At ANU, it takes five years for an idea to become a good idea, to become the idea of somebody high enough up who will then put it into practice. It takes, we always allow about a five-year gap. In the first two or three years, it gets knocked back. It gets knocked back for everything. Finally, someone puts a bit of quality money in, or somebody goes to America and sees how it happens, or someone's son or daughter suddenly needs something. Oh, boy, is that useful. And suddenly, the good idea that you had is suddenly told to you as a new idea, and you say, wonderful, because it doesn't matter whose idea it is, so long as you are gradually moving things up. But what we are going to need, therefore, for this independent student is the role of the supervisor, adequate support services, the possibility to attend conferences and the possibility to give professional seminars. They've got to move out from your own institution, out into the marketplace, the disciplinary base in which they are now preparing to join. Let me just go back to the role of the supervisor, which I still maintain is utterly crucial. You can have all the environment in the world and a bad supervisor will get you nowhere. A good supervisor, even in a poor environment, will probably help quite a bit. Again, talking just from the student viewpoint, and this is in a sense reinventing a little bit of a wheel that we had in the last session. With our own students, we asked, whoa, that's the wrong one first, sorry. No, that's right. We asked both international and Australian students what did they consider to be the qualities of a good supervisor. This is the Australian students. They wanted the supervisor to be intellectually stimulating. Look around. There's a room here of intellectually stimulating people. They wanted you to have a high level of expertise and competence. They wanted you to be available, personally approachable. Those were two quite different ways of saying it. It's not much good being available if you're not going to be, you know, if nobody likes you. They wanted you, they preferred if you had an interest in their topic. They thought that would help. And then this is a really Australian one. They didn't want you to be too directive, but they wanted you to set deadlines to structure the thesis and the research. They wanted you to return the drafts promptly, to encourage conference attendance and publications, and they wanted you to be politically powerful within your own community. All right? Now, when we looked at the requirements of international students, the absolutely crucial thing for the international student was the international reputation in the field of the supervisor. And they were perfectly happy if that supervisor was never available. They wanted this, the supervisor to be ready to edit the written English in the thesis. They wanted the supervisor to provide clear guidance and direction, much more strong guidance than was wanted by the Australian students. They wanted introductions to other experts, guidance to resources and sources, and they wanted approval, encouragement, and support. They wanted to be consulted on their examiners. They want the supervisor to serve as a referee for later job and scholarship applications. They want the supervisor to show concern for the student's welfare. This was a nice one, to be even-tempered, patient, and not too busy. And the last one, they would like you to speak clearly. What I'd like us to do now is to move into the workshop mode. Three different topics that I'd like the groups to discuss, but not all three. And so I put them up here as information planning, orientation planning, and integration planning. OK, we'll have 25 minutes, and we will allow you one overhead and about three minutes. Please stop the tape, allow 20 to 30 minutes for groups to answer the questions and appoint a spokesperson to report. The following presentations are from the workshops and may be compared with the feedback from similar discussion groups in your institution. Comments on information planning, orientation planning, and integration planning 
provides suggestions to assist in creating a supportive environment for local and international students. Personal introductions to members within the school or within the staff that they might be working with, uh, also with fellow. We thought about things like informal get-togethers on a fairly regular basis which inform students about staff in the department and their research interests, trips they've just had, conferences they've been to, that um, on an informal basis students could interact with other staff about those sorts of things. Um, also, I come from a very much integrated faculty where these things are, tend to be done at a faculty level and I have a personal belief that, this, that the higher the level within reason that we can do this, um, the better, because I think integration works best when the contact uh, is um, with as wide a group of people as possible, where the network that gets... Specific discipline information or, or that's related to their own specific projects and their own specific area um, about associations specific to international students is something on the st international student union because they uh, they um, normally have a separate union of their own and it's the role there of the supervisor to help to orchestrate the admin rather than just giving the student a whole lot of hand, you know booklets on rules and so on it was suggested a calendar of specific events that are coming up conferences um, workshops things like that if they had that to start with um, where staff had an open house where all staff and postgrad students went to that staff member's house sort of on a monthly or a couple of monthly basis so that students from overseas could become part of um, an Australian household for that evening and at least feel, feel part of the broader um, social culture rather than just the social culture within the academic department. So that was a sort of fairly large... Information on scholarships and funding. Uh, there's normally a, a part of the university which deals with this, Office of post, uh, Research and Postgraduate Studies, or sometimes the school has is The students need to be oriented to the structure of the academic program that they're entering, to the rules and policies, both of the university and faculty, in relation to that academic program, and also to the rights and responsibilities of the, both the students and the supervisors. And um, those three items presumably could be treated as a workshop in their own right. Uh, students. Um, we also thought that maybe workshops for staff on international student issues were, were important things to help people be aware of things they need to consider with international students. We've been a bit renegade. The integration process is a two-way process and we shouldn't lose sight, I think, of, uh, of the adjustment that they um, need to have to make. Uh, 